Hi, my name is Dr. Kristen Ferguson, and I'm the Director of Online Education at Gateway Seminary. We're located in Southern California, but we send you greetings. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to participate in your conference. Today, I'd like to share with you from my book, Excellence in Online Education, particularly about the research regarding online theological education. Can online education work? Should it work? Should we do it in theological education? And if so, how can we create a community of learning where spiritual formation can happen for our students? As we begin the first question, can online education work? Let's explore this from three different levels. The first is going to be secular metrics. So according to the research conducted over 20 years, uh, in the United States primarily, over thousands of schools and thousands upon thousands of students. Secular research is showing that online education can work. It can work. So according to these metrics, we see that online education is a critical component to school strategic plans. 70 to 80% of administrators over the last 10 years in particular are saying that online education is absolutely critical to their future as an institution. They're planning on online education and they depend on it for their success. Secondly, we see that online education, according to these secular metrics, can achieve the learning objectives as good or better when compared to face-to-face -face education. Uh, this is really important because we know that the learning objectives are the means by which we measure what a student is supposed to learn and how well they actually learn that information. You can have really good learning objectives or weak learning objectives, but the learning objectives in curriculum writing is the means by which we measure success of what we intend to achieve with our class. And so for faculty members who took this survey over these 20 years, they indicate that they think that they can achieve the learning objectives for their class as good or better than face-to-face -face education. Now, third is a very important point. Faculty uh, that took this survey also indicate that the course design strategy that you employ needs to have a specific design for online education. We cannot just replicate an on-campus class and put it online. That does not work. So if we're answering the question, can it work? Well, if you just put an on-campus class uh, minute by minute online, then that is not quality education. But they have found if you transform an on-campus class using those learning objectives and create it specifically for the online environment, it can. The quality increases dramatically when you do that. And then finally, according to these secular metrics, even in the COVID year of online education, 95% of students are saying that they would recommend online education or remote learning to others. This is important because we care about student satisfaction. Our students feeling satisfied with their learning experience in online education, according to these metrics, the answer is yes, sufficiently enough to recommend it to others. Now, this is really helpful information built on a lot of data and research. It's saying that yes, online education can work, but we're not just concerned with the same things that a secular institution is concerned with. As Christian educators and as theological educators, we have other values and other concerns that we have to attend to. And so let's look at the next level of research to consider if online education can work. The next level is, can Christian theological education work? So the Association of Theological Schools is the primary accrediting agency for theological institutions in Northern America. And ATS, Association of Theological Schools, conducted all sorts of research in the last 10 years. And this is because they, in 2012 and 2013, they allowed for an exception in their standards to the residency require, uh, requirement. So prior to 2012, they required all the master's degrees to have some 
portion of on-campus education, face-to-face -face education. There could be some online, but some had to be on campus. In 2012-2013, they allowed institutions to apply for an exception so they could offer fully online degrees. And in 2013, Gateway Seminary, the school I work for, actually applied for that. And we have the fully online MDiv, as well as other master's degrees, by that exception. A part of that exception was a requirement to submit an interim report every five years, along with other data and tracking measures to ensure that the quality of education was on par with the face-to-face -face education. And so they've collected all these interim reports, not just from Gateway, from lots of schools in Northern America. What they've discovered is that online education is so effective that they needed to reevaluate their standards of accreditation. So in 2020, they voted to rewrite the standards of accreditation to allow all schools, without applying for an exception, to allow all schools to offer fully online degrees. Just they had to demonstrate the quality of education was on par with face-to-face -face education. Leading up to this rewrite, leading up to the, this vote to rewrite the standards, they conducted all sorts of research to ensure they were making the right move and that they could prove that this was a quality instruction for students. And so they had peer review, they had focus groups, they had mixed method strategies, they, had, uh, f they flew in educators who had done year-long studies on online education and other different uh, strategies for education. And what they found is the same, that online education in theological schools also can work. So secular metrics say online education can work generally. Online theological education, according to ATS's extensive reviews, say it can work. Now there's one more layer though that we have to consider and that was the primary substance of my thesis in my doctorate program was what do evangelicals say about online education because we believe in the authority of scripture. And we don't just do things because they can be done. We have to consider, does the Bible allow us to do them? Should we do this? Is this the right way? Even methodology must be under the authority of scripture. And so my primary concern was to ask evangelical professors to survey them, asking them their perception of online education. And we found in this research, I found that 75% of evangelical professors said that online education was actually a benefit to theological education. They were very optimistic about online theological education, but there was a caveat. 50% of those people qualified their response and were concerned, especially with community and spiritual formation that typically happens in that community. They wanted to say, yes, we want online education to work for theological institutions. We understand the access and the global reach that this potential has for us to influence others for Christ. But we also know that our conviction is that we don't just teach students intellectually, we teach whole people who are being made into the image of Christ and they should be transformed spiritually, not just intellectually. So can you do that? online. And that was the primary issue that they demonstrated. And so that kind of moves us into now let's examine the literature. So those are the research methods that say, yeah, online education can work according to secular metrics. Online education can work according to even Christian theological metrics. But should we do it? And this is where the literature has gone back and forth for really decades, uh, kind of trying to discover how do we apply scripture to this methodology? Because of course, in New Testament uh, Jerusalem, there was an internet access. So how do we apply the truth of scripture to this new medium where we're trying to educate? And so I really appreciate 1 Corinthians 6.12 as we consider this topic. Everything's permissible, for me, says Paul, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. It's very tempting for institutions to pursue online education for fiscal reasons or for practicality reasons, 
But evangelical educators, we have a tension in our hearts because there's more than just practical realities that we're grappling with. We want to submit ourselves to the authority of Scripture and ensure that we're doing things that God endorses and wants us to do. And so we have to consider it from alternate perspectives as well. So in the literature, over the last 20 years, people have been going back and forth over primary concepts, theological concepts, about educating in the online medium. After reviewing all of this, I have boiled it down to two consistent arguments against online education that I think are important to consider and understand as you pursue online education. The first point is an idea of incarnational or embodied education and it being a necessity. So in this view, in this argument against online education, they believe that because Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us, taught and healed, brought in the kingdom, died on the cross as a real human, fully God and fully man, because Jesus was incarnated and embodied in human form, that means the way that we educate should model after what Jesus did for us. And we should be physically present with our students. We must be. It's not just should we be, we must be physically present with our students and do things like Jesus did. We eat with them and we walk with them and we talk with them and we share life with them. And this helps them be transformed into the image of Christ is when we're physically present with our students. And while I affirm the need and the glory of the incarnation and the need to be present, what I see as a counterpoint to that important argument is that the Bible actually presents both mediated and non-mediated forms of education. So by this I mean for medi non-mediated, we have a lot of commandments that have to be fulfilled physically. For instance, you have Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 that says don't neglect meeting together. They don't mean on Zoom. <laughs> they mean physically meeting together, not to neglect that. Uh, you have the fellowship through the breaking of bread, having a meal together and praying together in Acts 2 as the early church is being formed. You also have the Lord's Supper that has to be taken in person as people are sharing the substances together. Lots of commandments in scripture require believers to be physically present together, especially in the local church. And I think that's where it really comes down to is in the local church, these things are fulfilled. That's where these things are happening in the local church. But against this point of incarnational teaching as an absolute necessity, my understanding of scripture also I see mediated learning happening all over scripture. So for instance, Paul in Romans 15, 18 through 22, talks about his ambition to preach the gospel to all nations and that he's going to places where the name of Christ has not been shared before. And that is why it says he has been hindered from coming to them in Rome. He's been hindered from being physically present with them because he is on mission for God. God has sent him on mission and therefore he cannot be physically present, but he sends the letter of Romans instead. He sends a letter of Romans to help clarify their doctrine, to transform them spiritually, to give them insight on how to live as a church and function as believers in the community. And so we see that transformation and education is happening through a mediated means, i.e. the letter of Romans. Even though Paul says he'd like to be with them, the mission of God has taken him elsewhere. And so he sends a mediated form of education that is effective for their growth. And so we also see this just more generically as the word of God itself is a mediated form of transformation. It is the word of God contained in scripture, but it is something that is not face to face with God. It's something we read. It's a tool by which we grow and learn and are transformed. And so uh, even the prophets, God spoke his word mediated through the prophets. We see both mediated and non-mediated forms of transformation, education, and ministry happening in the church. And what it seems like is it depends on the mission of God. 
Uh, the local body has commandments that they must meet together. And the global body, as we minister to more and more churches and support more and more churches, the mediated forms of education, like the cyclical letters, are being used to help support them. Now, the second literature point that I see, so the first was the incarnational learning as a necessity. The second point is that spiritual formation is necessary, which we would all agree spiritual formation is necessary in our theological education, but that it happens in community and that community cannot happen online. So I want you to see that logical progression. Spiritual formation must happen. It only happens in community and community cannot happen online. Therefore, because they feel that community can't happen online, they assume spiritual formation is not happening online and therefore it's an illegitimate practice for theological education. And what I've read in the research, there's been a lot of different books and articles that have been um, published to help us understand uh, this logical fallacy, but the fact is that what we see um, is that community can happen online, uh, but it's not the same as in person. It is different because it's different medium. Spiritual formation can also happen online, especially when community elements are identified and replicated in the online environment. But here's the caveat, it must be designed intentionally into the class. Community does not just happen online without any effort or intentionality. You cannot just have a hallway conversation with your students or have a meal with your students and community just happens naturally. You as the professor or course designer must intentionally plan for when that community is going to happen and the shape that it's going to take and you must engage and be present in your class and require students to engage and be present in your class for that community and transformation to happen. We also understand from a biblical perspective, we see the term koinonia often in scripture. And my favorite passage related to koinonia is John 1, 3 through 4, where it says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship, which is koinonia, with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. In this passage, we see that their proclamation of the gospel and the recipients faith in the gospel is what unites them in koinonia, that they have fellowship with one another because they have fellowship together with God. So there's an ecosystem of fellowship happening, community, koinonia, because the gospel message, it doesn't define, isn't defined by physical presence, it's defined by the gospel message that is shared and believed and received. So I think that that's a very important concept as we understand online education. Where does our community lie? Does it lie in the fact that we're regionally located in the same place? You and I are located in very different contexts. I'm here in sunny South, Southern California <laughs> where there's surfers and in and out burgers. Uh, but you know what? You and I have a deep fellowship, though I've not met you. We have a fellowship because we both believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that fellowship connects us, whether we're thousands of miles apart or next door. And that's more powerful than even our physical presence together. And so um, according to Ebsol and Woods, what they say is that community can be replicated online if we understand the different elements included in community, such as consistent communication, intimacy where you're vulnerable with one another and you expose parts about yourself and your struggles in your life, honesty, commitment, diversity of viewpoints, and safety where it's okay to share things that you're struggling with and have the Word of God inform you together. So my conclusion is that yes online education can work, but should it work? I think yes. I think it should exist as the people of God accomplished his mission to take the gospel to the nations. I think that there's biblical precedence for legitimate mediated teaching and education that can foster spiritual growth, demonstrated by God himself through his word and by the apostles, especially Paul in his writings. And I think also that the primary community is still the local church. 
Theological education and the seminary is not the primary community of believers, it's the local church. But the seminary exists to support many churches as the global body of believers accomplishes the mission of God to make disciples of all nations. So we do it all together. It works together, as, and they're not in competition. It's a strategy for the mission, so we can do both for the mission of God. Now as we consider how to create community, a Christian community for online education, we need to understand that there's a primary threat to really good education online. It's called transactional distance. And this is a concept that most online educators are familiar with, and it means that the physical distance and separation of the professor and the, te uh, the teacher and the student, the physical distance between the two can increase miscommunication. It can increase variables in understanding. And if there's not a supplement of good quality interaction and clear instructions, learning can be detracted. You can have decreased learning because of the distance. And so we as online, as online educators have to be aware of the threat of transactional distance and actively work against it. We do this by intentionally planning for interaction in a structured and meaningful way. Uh, I love to use um, as a model for this, it's called the Community of Inquiry. It's developed by Garrison Anderson and Archer, and they're secular theorists, educational theorists that have developed this kind of three-circle structure. Um, and it, it's really popular in online education because it could be used in a variety of disciplines. And so I have adapted this structure to be specifically used in a Christian theological education a scenario. And so let me share this with you as a means to understand how to create community online. So there's three overlapping circles that all relate to one another. And when all three circles are present, we see community existing and flourishing. The first circle is regarding students' relationship to the content in the class. So every online class needs to have quality content. And for Christian online education, that content needs to be biblical. It needs to be from a biblical worldview. It needs to be seeped in scripture for it to be uniquely Christian. It needs to allow for reflection opportunities, that it's not just intellectual growth, but it's spiritual transformation as well. We need to have regular opportunities for students to engage with that content in meaningful ways. And the content that's shared overall should continue to point students and guide students towards the goal of making disciples of all nations. The quality of the content in an online course is going to deepen the community because that's what you're going to discuss, that's what the professor is going to reference, and it's going to drive the direction that the course is going to go. This one's kind of standard. Of course you should have content in a class, so that one's pretty easy. The next two are a little more um, subtle, but very, very important. The next circle that if we kind of continue on our three circle overlapping structure here is that the student has to relate to the professor. There's a student to professor relationship that aids the creation of quality community in an online class. And the professor has a very important role. It's very tempting and perhaps uh, easy to create an online class and then let students press play and the professor doesn't have to worry about it anymore. That's not going to create the kind of community that we know results in spiritual transformation. And so the professor must insert himself or herself into the class. Be present with that gospel-centered interaction, modeling Christ-likeness, modeling vulnerable transformation under the Word of God, um, giving prompt and substantial feedback so that students know that you're an active member in this community and that you are engaged and present in that class. Seeking all opportunities to build relationships, apply truth of Scripture in the student's life, and cultivate growth in our students. And then finally, we have student-to-student -student interaction. We need to create intentional opportunities for our students to relate to one another, to discuss with one another, share insights and 
practice gospel-centered interaction. Uh, we need content-rich opportunities. If the question is just, what did you learn this week? Uh, well, that's going to be a certain surface level activity that might not get down deep to the spiritual transformation that we're trying to cultivate in our class. And so asking really good questions where the students have to engage together. And in their engagement, as the professor, setting good structure and expectations so that they know what level of community is required of them in an online course. All of these things combined can help cultivate a community that is uniquely Christian and results in spiritual transformation. And this is really the model of the community inquiry adapted to uh, Christian education, but I have added a new element that's not included in the original because I think that scripture also requires that we seek missional impact opportunities in our class. So we're not just a community in and of ourselves. Our community of believers seeks to go out into the world of non-believers and add more of them to us and to expand God's kingdom around the world. And so I love to require my faculty to create intentional contextual opportunities where our students who are located around the world are required to go do certain experiences in their individual context, wherever that might be in the world. Maybe it's sharing the gospel, maybe it's discipling somebody, maybe it's interviewing a community member, and then taking those experiences and bringing them back into the online classroom. And when that happens, each student will see the multitude of contexts represented in the online students and see that the gospel, the word of God applies in all places and that they can see how their context might be slightly different, but the truth is the same. So we love to do these kind of missional impact opportunities and it actually fosters and fuels the community inside our online classes. I hope that this structure gives you a little bit of substance on how to create community. And there's one more element that I think if you just take this structure, and I know that there's professors in, in this conference and also perhaps administrators who are considering, how do I help faculty learn how to do this? Well, the way I do it is I apply this exact model to the faculty. The faculty are my community that I try to grow. So because of that, I'll create meaningful content for them regarding good online Christian education. I'll share it with them, email it with them. We, I will make opportunities to discuss their syllabus with them and their content and I will be present as the director of the program. I will be present with them as they grow as an online educator. I like to create opportunities where all the professors can discuss together what's working in online education and what's not? What, what strategies did you employ to draw students in? And what activities did you do to send students out of the online context into their world? This community helps everybody grow. It helps the quality of our overall program increase year by year. And finally, I like to create opportunities where they can test their skills in their classes and then come back to the community for feedback. All of these different things I hope will aid you as you seek to make disciples of all nations and equip our students for the mission that God has for them through online education or whatever method of education that you uh, intend to employ. Thank you again for this opportunity to share this insight with you and I, and I pray that it would be fruitful and effective in your context.